Way down in San Francisco, 42, long side burns and a mustache too. Cowboy boots and a buckskin jacket. Man, this cat's got a real cool racket. Have gun, world travel, find clue, unravel. Six shooter gun, always got him on the run. Hey, come, daddy, go. Watch him run. Hey, heaven, fuck. Well, I was born in Philadelphia and moved quickly to Detroit, then Columbus, then Pittsburgh, about once every less than a year. And uh, that was leading up to World War II. And then uh, when World War II broke out, the Army asked my father to volunteer to come to the Pentagon. They needed some banking help. So he did. They made him a captain and moved us down to Arlington. So that's where I grew up. At a young age, he was very serious about accomplishments in life. He always knew what he wanted to do. From the time he was very young, delivering papers, he would buy other paper routes and he'd build them up and sell them. And then, you know, he was always doing that. And he was in the studios with radio. I started putting records away in the radio station when I was 12. And they kind of made me the pet of the station or something. So uh, by the time I was 14, they gave me a little five minute high school sports show. So I reveled in that as I got my first fan mail. And that's where I learned everything. Well, in the haunted house at the top of the hill. The whole time I worked with Warren, I was learning different things about him that I never knew before, that a lot of people didn't know about him, musically, that he didn't really talk about. Ted Pettis had a record store in Washington. We started a label working out of the back of the record store called Potomac Records, which I changed to Colt 45 Records. And uh, in the meantime, I did this, wrote the song, and we recorded it in a Washington studio and put it out. Somehow or another, it attracted the attention of Dick Clark and his Swan label. When Warren told me that he had been on Bandstand before, I said, you're kidding. Dick Clark, really? He said, yeah, wasn't that big of a deal? I said, no, it's, it's a pretty big deal. And he said, no, back then, you know, they needed people to go on the show. And, and he had apparently been on numerous times, but acted like it was no big deal. I called Warren one day and I said, do you realize you're all over the internet? And he says, what? And I said, yeah. I said, you're hot in Europe, dude. I don't understand this. What, what's going on in Europe? Well, I've discovered that they've got a craze for rockabilly. And when Warren did these songs earlier, late 50s and early 60s, it was a little bit of country, a little bit of, you know, rock and roll. And these collectors were just going crazy over his music. But he was very, very humble about that. He said, I, I do remember. He said, I believe. Somebody told me at one time one of my records went for $1,000. I said, now you're exaggerating. He says, maybe. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, if the water's getting hooked, the water's getting loving to me. I got a hot cup on the graph. I want to bring it to play. I want to move along. The Crumps, husband-wife team, uh, he ran the radio station in Arlington that I went back to after jumping around various stations in the Washington area. I ended up back there as a program director at 22. They said, come down, help us get this Norfolk station started, but we can't pay you. That's the problem. I said, oh yeah, that, that's a small problem. <laughs> he said, here's what we'll do though. Everybody wanted to be a disc jockey. So he said, start the American Broadcasting School. WCMS is a daytime station. We're off there at dusk. So you got the whole night, the station's all yours. You teach a school, keep the money. That's your income, as long as you work for me during the day and handle the promotions and do a three-hour shift. Do this for us, and we will make you the general manager of our next station. So, hey, cool. <laughs> Two years later, uh, the school was doing well. I was making some good money. So they came to me and said, you know, this station has been so successful and it's making so much money, part, and." part by you, that we can keep our promise because we're not gonna buy, we're not gonna buy any more stations. This station can do everything we wanna do, make us all the money we can spend, and there's no point in us sitting on airplanes two, three days a week, you know, so we can't keep our promise, what can we do? So I said, well, gee, I don't know. And so uh, I looked into buying a nightclub and the other usual stuff that disc jockeys do. And I finally decided, you know, what I really love, music, producing music. I love writing commercials. What I really need is a recording studio, and there is none here. So instead of going to Nashville or someplace, I decided to open here, which I did. And uh, the studio proved to be quite successful. 
First is a music studio, just music. Then we got into commercials. He would get a call for a voiceover, and the, the guy would say, yeah, I'm looking for this and that. And okay, so well, Warren's thinking to himself, okay, well, now i got to call the agent. All right, I've got to call the agent. Oh, wait, ooh, I'm going to need a director. I'm going to need a producer and uh, an engineer. Oh, if we need all that, I guess we're going to need a studio. So he was thinking to himself, and he said, you know, it'd be great we could, we could just centralize everything, uh, you know, one roof overhead and do everything in that building. And that was the genius of Studio Center. That's what Studio Center became. He, in essence, built the first national recording service for, um, for radio commercials with about uh, 220 talent under contract, I believe a staff of about 35, and uh, winning awards that were unprecedented. Uh, when I left the studio, I believe their scorecards had 670-some uh, awards that we'd won. Warren loved the awards because, again, it's just, you know, it's justification. It, it's, it's, it confirms everything that you know to be true, and that was we were the hottest production facility on the East Coast. I think we always look forward to them to a point where we decided one year that we were going to do and produce the whole awards, Addy Awards ceremony. And this was a first. I mean, nobody had ever done anything like this. And that's Warren, you know, he was executive producer. That would sum up his life, really. He is always producing something. He's either drawing, designing, um, creating, building something. He would think about how he could make it funny for him, you know, and he would just sort of even sort of lampoon his own spot. And he would he would go ahead and produce that because it was going to be fun. And he just did a lot of stuff uh, because it was it was fun. Back in those days, the equipment was not the best. You know, he did the best we could with the with the money we had, and uh, you'd play something back. And you'd, you would hear the distortion, and you go, oh, damn it, it peaked out. You know, that's, that's not good. So uh, Warren, brilliant mind, there's this casing in the back of it. I guess it's a, it's a large box. He puts an, a red light on top of it, OK? So when the client would come in, and we'd lay down the tracks of the jingles or, or the gospel sessions or whatever, he said, now take a look at that light, and you watch that light. If that light lights up, we had a problem, we got distortion. And he said, okay, fine. Okay, so, you know, clients always look at that red light. It was never hooked up. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that, uh, you know, it was, uh, gee, Mr. Miller, that, uh, I tell you, that was, a, that was a great take because that light didn't come on once. And uh, I always thought that was so cool. The last TV commercial that was produced in the old building before they turned video into audio was for one of those psychic hotlines. And at the end of a grueling day, uh, the client had asked Warren, how much is all this gonna cost? And Warren said, well, you're the psychic, you tell me. And they didn't laugh, which I thought was pretty funny. Well, you know, a lot of the times when people come to our home, They'll tell us that our home is interesting. They'll say, you go around a corner and it's like you're not expecting the next thing. Well, Warren's kind of like that with his life. It's always another discovery and you're not expecting that. Like this past um, Valentine's Day, I went upstairs to get ready and he's got a, a, a sports jacket on and a nice red shirt and I said, oh, you're, you're dressing for this, Warren. And I dressed to compliment what he was wearing and went downstairs and not too much longer, the doorbell rang. Here he had hired this quartet to come in to sing love songs to us. And I'm thinking, who can top this? He's always thinking with all that's on his plate right now. He wanted me to have a perfect Valentine's Day. He really treated each individual as somebody special and wanted to make sure that they got that kind of a tip of the hat. Warren loved all four of his children and their individuality. He loved them for who they were. If he could do anything for any of them, he would certainly do it. He had just an incredible strength of will. He, he just, he didn't say, I'm beat, 
let's, let's pick this up again tomorrow. There were certain things he had to have done, and he got them done. Working with Warren was just a real privilege because he taught me uh, everything. And uh, it was easy going, you know, because we just, like I said, we saw him. And we were eye to eye on these things. We had a vice president once called Warren a small genius. And I would say Warren was a flat out genius, period. You couldn't help but be inspired by his drive and ability to constantly improve and outdo himself. Warren has given me many more adventures and um, experiences that I maybe would not have had. There won't be any replacing Warren Miller. I've been blessed with a, a just a storybook life where I did everything I wanted to do. The people that I've met, people I've worked with, this, this has been great. God has been good to me.